All right. Hey there, everybody. This is Kenny and... Kenny squared. <laughs> what a great looking background. And this is the sports on the Positive Tip podcast. Kenny, how you doing? Uh, doing good. It's, it's crazy because we're a lot closer to opening day than you would expect. And also it's selection Sunday. That's always a nice day. Ah, uh, favorite time of the year. So did you start to get a little bit excited about uh, college basketball, about the tournament now? Yeah. Um, okay. Like, and I forgot exactly. I've heard this a few times, but like people kind of saying like, it kind of feels a little bit more like a normal sports year this year, obviously, as opposed to last year. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Yeah. But yeah. I'm excited yeah. for it. I'm excited to see some of the stuff happen. Yeah, I am too. We're going to get to the tournament in a second too. I, uh, let, let's go on some, um, uh, let's go around the horn a little bit and let's start with baseball and spring training. Any Anything going on with your Yankees that we should know about? How are you feeling about them? What is this like the third week or so of spring training? You feeling still good about them? Yeah, ish. I'm still a little worried because uh, the biggest injury right now, hopefully just the one, has been Zach Britton. Um, and he, it sounds like at first they were like, oh, he'll be out for about a month or so. But now it sounds like he's probably going to be about two or three months, like, don't expect him back until like probably around the all-star break, which Ooh, like wow. the Yankees okay. can. Yeah. Which like at first they're like, Oh yeah. A month, but which like they can handle it. Especially I think the biggest thing with him, he's got to be ready for the playoffs. Um, but I think I really like the signings that well, signing Darren O'Day signing um, Justin Wilson, both right. former Mets. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but I do think that like they can, they can weather that storm. Um, so far, everyone's looked healthy. I really have liked, I saw a little bit of uh, Corey Kluber's outing yesterday. I think he's looked really good. Um, right. And then like, to me, if this team is healthy, like who would be their competition in the American league? Possibly the White Sox, the A's. Yeah. I mean, the Rays have taken a huge step back. The Astros, they lost George Springer. Yeah. Uh, Justin Twins. Verlander's not going to be there for most of the year. Yeah. The Twins, maybe? Maybe the Twins, but the Twins can never do it in the playoffs. Neither can the A's. Yeah. Yeah, if they, if they beat the Yankees in even one game in a playoff, I'm not even sure. Uh, the Twins and the A's also. Uh, the A's is always surprising every year. Uh, you know, Toronto, probably not. Maybe they have really good pitching though. Um, I saw a stat that said um, there are three pitchers the last three years that have had sub three ERAs every single year. Garrett Cole, Jacob deGrom, and Hinjin Ryu. So I wouldn't sleep on the Jays yet, but still. Yeah. yeah. And, and the White Sox, yeah, I know you mentioned them, but they've also got that outstanding pitching and they made a couple of moves in the off season too. So but listen, I, you're right. We can talk about some of these good teams all day long. I think the Yankees potentially could be a great team. Yeah. It's, it's going to be hard for some of those teams to keep out. Like even, you know, Cleveland Indians there, I think will be good. They always are. Uh, you know, I know they lost some pieces and, and losing their heart with Lindor, but I think the two guys from the Mets, if they play every day, will do well there, you know? Yeah. And they got good pitching too, so. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll, it'll be interesting. I, I don't see any red flags with the Mets. I, I, you know, the uh, Carlos Carrasco is the only serious injury I think, you know, they have so far. I, I like their depth. I like their bench a lot. I think, you know, there's a lot of different pieces. And, and they were saying this week that the DH thing is not totally out of the question yet. They haven't made a decision on that yet? Um, as of right now, there is none, but they said that they're right. still open to it. Same thing with the expanded playoffs. They've talked about like right, right now we're going with the 2019 plan, but before the season starts, that could change. Oh, that'd be interesting to see. I think I'd love to see DH for the Mets because they, they've got, you know, with Dominic Smith and, and Pete Alonzo is, is the main thing. Alonzo looks great, by the way. 
and I haven't watched more than maybe a half an inning of a game yet, but I've seen the highlights uh, in the, usually in the morning, and, and he looks he looks like he's ready to come back uh, big time from last year. Um, there's a lot I like about the Mets. It's hard though because you know you got to do it on the field, and you know it's been a lot of different years over my lifetime where. You know, we go into spring training, we go into the season, we say, hey, we got a good team. And then, you know, uh, it's it's a bust. You know, this is definitely not going to be 1991 or 92 and Bobby Bonilla and Vince Coleman <laughs> and Eddie Murray. And, you know, uh, those teams should have been good. Brett Saberhagen. But um, this team, I, I think with Lindor, hopefully he makes the adjustment to the National League better than, you know, a lot of other players at – you know, and I don't know if that's even an adjustment. It's still a different game, right? Don't you think in both leagues? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but I look at Mookie Betts was one to yeah. adjust from American League, National League, and he won a title in his first year. So Lindor could do it, too. He's got that oh, talent. Yeah. I, I listen, the guy is all world. I mean, and, and I think it's, you know, if you're a Mets fan, you're just jaded from – you know, there's been players over the years that they traded for or signed that really worked out well, you know, such as, you know, Mike Piazza, um, Gary Carter, you know, um, Cespedes. Even. Delgado. Uh, yeah, Carlos Delgado, Al Leiter. I mean, there's been a lot, but it's just those those ones that really stand out. The, you know, uh, Carlos Beltran was another one I think worked out great, but it's just the, you know, Roberto Alomar. It's the Cleveland connection there. The Roberto <laughs> Alomar, Carlos Baega. And, you know, I, I wanted those guys to do good so uh, so much. And um, But I think Lindor is a real deal. I really do. I don't. There's not a, really a hole on the Mets. I mean, they're fine at, at every position. They've got depth not only in the outfield. They've got depth in the infield. Uh, they've got depth at catching. I think that uh, – and, and they've got, you know, good starting rotation, and they've got – the best bullpen I think they've had in a long time. So I'm looking forward to some good things, but let's, let's go around the national league for a second. And I know we'll do a, a an in-depth baseball preview probably in a couple of weeks, but uh, what are some, who are some teams that, uh, that you think will really be good again this year in the national league? Um, I'll start with the obvious Padres. Um, right. I don't know yeah. if you saw this highlight, Fernando Tatis went and scored without a ball leaving the infield. He uh, had an infield single, went first to third on a ground ball to second, and then scored on a pop-up to, like, shallow left field, but, like, this, the shortstop went back and caught it. Amazing. Um, also, their pitching is really good. Uh, yeah. Um, I think a team that a lot of people might be kind of sleeping on is Col – or not Colorado. Connection to Colorado. St. Louis. Cardinals, um, yeah. I think, yeah. I think Goldschmidt – and Arenado is the first, is the best first and third baseman combo probably in all of baseball. And I think like they were a pretty good team last year. I think give them a full season, give everyone like a season to be healthy and kind of normal. I think that they have the potential to be really good. I, I agree. I, you know, the Cardinals are going to be dangerous. There's just no doubt. And I have to say Dodgers Padres, the 19 or so times they play, that'll be must see TV. You know, most of those yeah. games will be way too late to see for for me, but you got to have that as a Sunday night game or as a game of the week or something because those two teams are so evenly matched. I I'm trying to think of another team. I think the Reds, even though they lost Bauer, will be good. I think the Marlins will take a big step up. I, I just I love their pitching. Uh, I, I, don't I think the Phillies will be better than they were last year with Girardi. Give him – you know, I still think Girardi's one of the best managers in the game. And, and so, but I, you know, listen, the Braves have, have just a, uh, I know Marquez is retired and that's a big loss for them because he was like their leader and, you know, very consistent player. And, uh, but, but the Braves are just very, very good. They're, they're deep in every position as well. They signed their, they re-signed their key guys. I know they let Adam Duvall go, which I thought was odd, but their pitching is, is, outstanding i think they're starting pitching it, it's going to be tough the, them and the mets i think that'll be a good good rivalry this year and i wouldn't sleep on washington coming back you know i think that i think that washington will be good again uh you know they had a terrible year last year 
But I, I think it's the Dodgers and Padres and everybody else. I, I do agree. I think the Mets, until it's proven, you know, that they could, you know, get 10, 15 games over 500, that they'll, they'll be a, a good player, you know, good contender. So it's exciting. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, looking forward, I'm with you. I'm looking forward to baseball. Let's, let's shift over to the NBA. Uh, things kick back off uh, after the All-Star game. Uh, what were some of your thoughts on the All-Star game, by the way? Um, first of all, Steph Curry can shoot the lights out of any building. Um, him making some of these, yeah, like so absolutely crazy. Um, also I think Damian Lillard's probably still one of the most underrated stars out there. If he, he teamed up with like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and like, and I mean, we always talk about that one where he, um, we are the <laughs> game winning three. Um, but like, I feel like. <laughs> Like, I don't know. I wish that he would team up with someone, like, I don't know, maybe come to the Knicks and really, like, just thrive. I would love to see him make a deep playoff run. But he also doesn't have a ton of pieces around him. Yeah, they that, that team seems to have taken a step or two backwards, even though they're better than they were last year. But I thought they would have continued to move forward. But they've had a lot of injuries, you know, as well. And uh, C.J. McCollum is, is really good, but he's been hurt a lot of the year. I agree. I think Portland, he's so good. I mean, he he's just one of those players that is really smart, but he also has a world of talent, you know, but, and he quietly does his thing and he's never like raised his hand and said, Hey, get me out of Portland. You know? Um, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's why I think Portland and Oklahoma city, you know, they, uh, and maybe you throw Memphis in there. They're like the only kid in town. Like, you know, like, uh, there's not, there's not really, uh, I think in Oklahoma city, there's college teams, but Portland, there really isn't. So it's like, there's no baseball team, no football team, you know? So you have some college football, good fo- fo- football teams, but they're not in Portland in Oregon. So, uh, you know, the, they all, they sell, they've sold, they've, that arena, they've always sold that out for years, uh, even when they had the old one. So the fans there really love them. But it's been a long time. I mean, they were contenders back in the 90s. Uh, they were, they've been steady contenders throughout, but they never seemed to get over that hump, you know? Yeah. Um, any surprises uh, the first couple of games here in the NBA? Well, let's go back to the All-Star game for a second. How about Giannis? Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Perfect shooting. Like, that's the best All-Star performance ever. And I know, like, a lot of it is dunks, but still, like, he made a three even quarter, especially too. the All-Star game. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, did you get the sense they played especially hard? Especially like people do stuff. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I think they played really hard. Since they've gone to this format, has LeBron's team lost? I don't think they have. Right? They seem to win it every year. LeBron as um, team captain is four and zero. He's four and zero. That's what I thought. Okay. Wow. I mean, he picks. Uh, I mean, that was quite a squad. Quite a squad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, our guy didn't really show up, it seemed like, for uh, Julius Randle, you know? Uh, that always uh, seems to happen, though. No, I know when David Lee made it, he barely did it. <laughs> you know, I remember back when Allen Houston and Latrell Sprewell used to make it, they didn't do anything. It was, it's, it's, been, it's been odd. Um, I, I think the NBA is, is going to really start to take shape, I think. You know, now I think you'll see some of these teams that have been surprising start to fall back a little bit. I don't know what to make of the Eastern Conference. What what is what's your thoughts on the Eastern Conference? I don't know. It seems kind of weird because there still seems like there's a lot of teams that are kind of I don't know if they're good or I don't know if they're bad. Um, yeah. Honestly, yeah. like to me, the Knicks, like after watching their first game, I was like, oh my gosh, are we back to this? But then Julius Randle. Uh, he became up. the first player since um, – who was it? Mark Jackson. First player since Mark, Mark Jackson, Jackson to have two yeah. triple doubles in the same season. Um, yeah. But, like, it seems like they might still be in the mix. Um, we are about a week and a half away from the trade deadline, so that might shake things up a little bit too. Um, but, yeah, I don't really know what to make of – really a lot of the teams in the East, it seems like you have Brooklyn and Philly and then like everyone else is kind of in the mix there. Miami yeah. I see here is making a run for it again, but yeah, I don't know. 
it'll be interesting. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, Miami, uh, Toronto, Indiana, I'll throw the Celtics even in there. I'm not sure what to make of those teams. You know, um, they, they've all kind of been very, very inconsistent. I thought all of them should have been a lot better. So it's yeah. that time, it starts to get to crunch time a little bit. Uh, it was still maybe a month out from really, really getting in crunch time from the NBA. But uh, it, and listen, Knicks just hang in. I mean, you know, this is a tough road trip they have right now. They won the game they had to win yesterday. So let's see what happens. I mean, Julius Randle, when he wants to be, is just, he's just a beast. You know, he really yeah. is. He's, uh, he, he's really been surprising. Um, all right, let's jump over to the NCAA tournament. So Selection Sunday later on today. Um, what, what are some things you're looking for? Who are some teams that you've got your eye on? A, any sleeper teams? Let's hear your overall thoughts here. Um, well, I'm still a little gun shy on picking sleeper teams because like I followed some of uh, the college tournaments, but not a ton. Um, something that I thought was very interesting, Cleveland State. Um, won their tournament, so that's exciting. People will be happy about that. Um, Cleveland State, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know. I think it's the Horizon League. I forgot what league they play for. Um, but also, and we'll, I guess this will probably be a bit of a segue, um, Georgetown winning and taking out, uh, who was it, top-seeded Villanova? Do I have that right? They did. They beat on their way there. Yeah, they beat Creighton yesterday, but Villanova on their way. Yeah, in the semifinals. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think also Georgetown, led by our good friend Patrick Ewing, I think will be a very interesting team to watch. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know how good Georgetown really is. Uh, I, I think they really maybe they gelled and they went on a run. We see that every year. Uh, we'll come back to Georgetown in a second. I I, I think uh, Iona. Also, with Rick Pitino as a coach in the first year, they're getting in because they won their, their conference tournament. I think they were like 13 and five, so they had a pretty good record, too. And, and you can't sleep on a guy. I mean, he's 68 years old. Hard to believe Rick Pitino is up there that, that far up there in age, but he's got a chip on his shoulder because he really felt like, even though he did, he really messed up at Louisville, but he didn't think he deserved to be fired. And he's, he's still bitter. Talked about that yesterday, you know, that – so that team is rallying around him. I, I would pick them as my sleeper. I don't know where they're going to land at, but I would say that I wouldn't want to play that team if I'm, like, you know, a big, big-time college team. Um, so let's come back to Patrick Ewing, and then yeah. I want to hear I want to hear uh, what you think about some of the other uh, so-called favorite teams because <clears throat> uh, I think that kind of took shape a little bit too. So Patrick Ewing gets stopped by Madison Square Garden security. I don't remember the call that they said where. I'm sure it was probably he was going in a restricted area or something like that. And they didn't recognize that Madison Square Garden, Patrick Ewing. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, did you find that hard to believe? I mean, is there is there probably a problem with security at Madison Square Garden? Because same thing with Spike Lee, although I think the guy recognized Spike Lee. I just told him you got to take the different elevator, which apparently he had taken that elevator for years. You know, Spike Lee's a huge Nick fan and he doesn't get his tickets for free. He's always paid for, you know, his tickets. He, he's when he was a kid, he said he started, you know, paying for tickets all the way up in the rafters. And as he made money, he worked his way down. And then you had the thing with Charles Oakley with him wrestling him on the floor. I mean, I, what, what do you, what do you make of it? I mean, to me, Patrick Ewing was more stunning than the other two. Cause I'm like, Seven foot tall guy, you can't you can't miss him. I mean, and and Patrick Ewing, what he means to the Knicks, his numbers in the rafters. I mean, it's just, I, it just didn't make any, not even an ounce of sense that somebody could tap the security guard. Wait a second, that's, that's Patrick Ewing. He don't need ID, you know. I mean, so yeah. what did you make of that when you when you read that? Yeah, like I completely understand if like a security guard is doing their job. Like yeah. I get that. Um, but also, it is kind of hard to believe that maybe someone doesn't recognize Patrick Ewing. Because, like, especially, like, I would assume, like, there's probably a certain number of people that, like, you should be able to recognize right away. Are these same people going to stop uh, Dolan from entering the no. arena? Like, yeah. or even, like, some of the current Knicks. Like, would you stop Julius Randle? Would you stop R.J. Barrett? Like, it does seem kind of odd. 
And I think I would think that Patrick Ewing should stick out like a sore thumb. There's not many seven foot guys, and especially like his face should look at least like, oh wait, you look kind of familiar. But I think they also said that the guy didn't recognize him. So I don't know. I think it's part of it also, um, it's funny because we talked about in our um in our sermon today about offense and how um, like we should be quick to not get offended. Like, and I understand Patrick Ewing's heart. Like, come on, like I've done all of this great stuff for the Knicks, for Madison Square Garden. And now I'm like coaching Georgetown. Like, but at the same time, maybe he should be like, okay, maybe this guy doesn't know who I am. Let me pull out my ID or just like point upwards at the Raptors or something. Yeah, yeah, that's me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he was offended. He he was he was offended. I, I you know Patrick Ewing is is a really classy individual, so um, he didn't make too big a deal of it. But you know he, he was he was like you, you mean to tell you didn't recognize me here? You know in, in in Madison Square Garden you didn't recognize me. I don't know. And you know Dolan, it just seems like um, the more the Knicks. Because the Knicks are getting good, obviously, and I think the Knicks are going to get good and be good for for a while here, and and so it's it's fun again, right? And the Rangers, you know, very quietly, you know, hockey we don't really follow as much, but very quietly the Rangers are building a really good team too. Because the last few years they got rid of all their veterans and they just have a core of really good young players from people that, you know, talking to people that know hockey, I don't, and and the Rangers, you know, have just about a winning record and they're doing well. So Madison Square Garden has the potential to turn back into a really, really fun place, especially in the spring. I mean, in the spring, in the 90s, you know, we own the sports world. You know, a lot of times we'd lose in the playoffs and Knicks and the Rangers, but, but it was fun. You know, it was exciting. But Dolan, it just seems to be just a sour guy, you know, that and, – and it seems like the rest of the atmosphere kind of reflects him. And, and I hope that that changes because, like I said, it's, it's one thing if you're sour and the team is losing, but – you know, you're sour and, and now you're starting to build something here. The basketball people know what they're doing here, you know, uh, and, and you can just feel that something is building. It's not going to happen overnight, but but something is building. And like I said, same with the Rangers, too. So um, let's go back to the tournament. So you've got, you know, some big time favorite teams, right? It looks like Michigan State is coming up. Uh, they may, they've made a big run here towards the end. I always thought Michigan was really good, but I mean, to me, it's it's Baylor and Gonzaga and everybody else. I mean, the, it seems like Baylor, especially, seems like they've got like two or three NBA players. Um, what what are some of your thoughts on on the teams that that are that are definitely going to be? I, I I can't imagine neither one of those two teams will be number one seeds. I don't know who the other two will be, but um, what are your thoughts on those two teams? Um, I had, I thought I had seen this earlier. Gonzaga is undefeated. How interesting would it be if they won the tournament? Like going yeah. a perfect season. When was the last time that happened? UCLA in no, the 70s? 70, 76, Indiana. Okay. Yeah. Because that would be really interesting. I think that would be quite the story. Um, there's two other things. Um, I had noticed Ohio State also is in the top 10. Yeah. I, I would assume yeah. they're probably a two seed. Yeah. Um, but also it seems like it's still going to be kind of a bizarre tournament because there's still a lot of those teams that are usually good but aren't. Um, Duke, I had seen they got kicked out. Well, they didn't get kicked out of the tournament, but they had guys test positive, so they um, took themselves out. Uh, Virginia as well. Both of them, like in Virginia, I remember for a few years, was number one seed like all the time. Yeah, very good, yeah. Um, but also now, I guess we'll see what happens. They said that they'll still participate in the tournament if selected, but I don't know if they're going to get selected. Like, it would be weird to see Duke as like a 13 seed, but yeah. who knows? <laughs> that would, because I think Duke is only 13 and 11. I think Virginia's record is a little bit better than that. But Kentucky is not getting in. There's no way. Um, I, and no. I don't think they, they won that tournament. So it would be weird to not have Kentucky for it. has been a long time. But Kentucky was the last team that went into the Final Four, right? I think undefeated. Um, I mean, remember a few years ago they got beat by Wisconsin in the semifinal. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. I do remember that. Paul that Towns. was uh, wasn't that an Anthony Davis team. It might have been. Oh, yeah, I thought it was Paul Anthony okay, Towns. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, they they were really really good, and, and Wisconsin played the game, slowed them down, and 
and won it there in the last minute or so. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say Gonzaga, if, if they run the table here, that would be, that would be a lot of fun. I, you know, Baylor, I think is, is the team to beat for me. I think that we'll see, you know, Villanova is always good. Uh, I, you know, I love Jay Wright. I think he's an outstanding coach. I think he doesn't get enough credit. Uh, Florida state is, is, is very good. So there's some teams scattered throughout the country. I think uh, that I, I could see stepping up here, but I think it's Baylor and Gonzaga and everybody else. And th- those two teams just, yeah. And again, you know, you and I, we, we admitted this a couple of weeks ago. We hadn't watched much college basketball. I've watched a lot more in the last two weeks. Uh, so I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit of a feel, but it, it's those two teams. All right, let's shift gears. So we'll, I, I guess we'll, we'll be knee deep in the tournament by the time we talk next under, Sunday. So uh, we'll have what the Sweet 16, you know, um, are, are headed towards the Sweet 16. 16. Um, yeah. So let's talk about one year ago and. We'll talk about it from a sports and a God perspective, right? Um, so I, I will just never forget. I remember you texted me. I'm watching the Knicks and I think the Hawks. I had just gotten home from the last business trip that I took now. Um, it was it, I was up in Connecticut. I had just gotten home, was catching some of the Knicks, and I remember you texted me. And the first text said that one of the Jazz players tested positive for COVID. I remember looking at the text. I'm like, okay, no big deal. And the next thing you texted me was the game was canceled. And I was still like, okay, maybe about 10 minutes later, you texted me that the season was on. And I'm like, wait a minute, they're still playing. The Knicks was still playing. Other games were still going. And then I turned to ESPN because it was a Wednesday night. I'll never forget it. And ESPN is, it was, was going to cover that game. Uh, the Jazz or whoever they were playing, and they were stunned, and and they were like, "We're, we're just getting word that the season's getting." They kept showing the video of Mark Cuban, right, looking at his phone and saying, "Oh my God, if Dallas was still playing." It was it was stunning, and then a day or two later, baseball shuts down, and it's months without anything, without anything when it comes to sports. So, you know. As someone at, at your age, young and you know, young family and everything like that, it was almost for me, probably for you too, that when sports stopped, then the realization of how serious this was like hit me. And that shouldn't be the case because we revolved our lives around sports so much. But what were some of your thoughts <laughs> and feelings when those first couple of days and when sports stopped? Uh, what? How did you feel? Um, it was definitely very bizarre. I also felt kind of annoyed because I'm like, this is like the best time of the year for sports. Oh, that's right. And then everything's later, getting shut down. That's right. A few days later, the tournament was canceled. That's right. Right. Yeah. Because um, also like a couple of days before, um, so Ohio was a little early on kind of trying to shut some stuff down. Um like the schools had announced that they were going on a little bit of a break and then um and then like the the stay-at-home orders and everything like that started to come down the pike um but yeah i think like the day that the sports world shut down was very like surreal and it also was like whoa so like what do we do now i think it really just kind of i don't want to say panic but it definitely like raised some concern that like First of all, this thing is very serious. And then secondly, that it's not something that's just going to go away right away. Um, now, originally, like, as people were trying to figure it out, and then also, like, trying to figure out, like, adjusting personal lives and things like that, I kind of thought, okay, well, if we do this for, like, about six or so weeks, we'll be back to normal by the summer. And then, of course, like, we're a year later, and hopefully this summer we'll see that. Um, yeah. But I think it is very interesting just like how quickly, um, I don't want to say how quickly panic set in, but also like how quickly, like all of the sports were like, no, we're, we're not going to try this until we kind of figure out what we're up against. Um, Cause like, I remember like a couple of days beforehand, all of the major sports kind of released like a joint statement saying like our media and our personnel aren't going to try to interact as much. 
Um, and then, of course, like Rudy Gobert kind of taking it the whole extra step by touching everything and licking everything, which caused like a huge rift. Interesting, just kind of as a side note, the Jazz are like the top team right now in the NBA. Imagine if they had traded Rudy Gobert like they were kind of talking about. Just kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, but then just like um, reading that article about how like things have changed in the last year, I think it is very interesting because like at first we didn't think that we would get any sports, like all sports 2020 would be gone. Um, but every single sport finished their season. And I think that's a huge testament to people working hard at creating safe and health protocols yeah. to make sure that that happens. Um, yeah. And like, it's interesting because they said some of the lessons learned like in the sports world is first of all, like testing is important. It's like, you see it with any sport that's happening right now. These guys are getting tested probably every other day or every few days here. And especially right before game days to make sure that everyone is in a safe environment. And I think that that's very important. Um, as they continue along this journey. Um, also what's very interesting is the bubble works. Like baseball didn't have any positive tests until Justin Turner in the eighth inning of game six. Um, or was that, no, was that game seven? Last game of the world series. Yeah. Um, the, the NBA didn't have any positive tests. Uh, the NFL didn't have very many positive tests throughout their playoffs. And the NFL didn't even do like a bubble. They kind of said like, please don't go anywhere. Um, and I think what was also interesting in that article was they said that one of the biggest issues with COVID outbreaks wasn't people within the organization. It was people going outside. Um, we talked as one of our first podcasts about the, the Indians pitchers that were, that were going out and doing stuff. Yeah, that's right. Um, that seems like a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, the Rockets player, like, having sex with a girl in his hotel room. Yeah. Like, a lot of the issues and a lot of the protocols being broken weren't because, like, people weren't being safe. It was because people were being dumb. Yeah. Um, so I just think that's very interesting. And really, like, it seems like the sports world might be a little bit back to normal. Like, I think most, if not all, uh, baseball ballparks are going to have some fans. Texas, of course, is like, we're going to have everybody, but you know, yeah, we'll I, see I, what I, happens. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. I, you articulated it so well. I don't have a ton to add. I just, um, it, 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 you know, I know God was in everything right from the beginning because while we've lost so many people and, you know, for us, sports was a barometer, you know, for us. But I think about how strict Ohio got pretty quickly because you guys had, just awful amount of cases there. And then New York City, it's still hard to get used to not seeing hardly anyone walking around in, in the city. It's, it, it, you know, and then Broadway shutting down. And, you know, all of it just happened probably within a week's time span. And, it, you know, all, it was just one of those moments, Kenny, you know, where all you can do is, is pray, you know, because you just felt helpless, you know, stay, stay at home, not a problem for me, that's great. Um, not a problem for you either. You know, I mean, we, we love being at home. Um, but you know, it was important to not, you know, be afraid either, you know, and, and to be, and to know that God is with you, but it's, it's one of those things. I know God, you know, puts doctors here. I know, you know, God invented masks, you know, all the things that we needed to, to protect ourselves. I, I'll tell you, um, a, a good thing that came out of it for me. And so, uh, you know, we, we took a flight down to New Orleans that next weekend and we just, we, we prayed and we, we wound up going and it was hardly anybody on the flight because we were getting out, you know, two new babies here, you know, uh, two new pups. And it, it was, it was surreal being in the Atlanta airport, being in the New Orleans airport, and it was practically nobody, you know, that quickly. And it was less than a week into this that that we had that we had went um but you know the real good that came out of it for me was i i tell you and i told you this i got to watch the mlb network a lot and they showed vented stuff man i 
I, I relive the 1971 World Series, the 1968 All-Star Game, stuff that I, I didn't remember that well, you know, um, uh, the 86 World Series uh, with the Mets, obviously, 69 World I mean, they had vintage stuff on. They even had some of the, you know, some of the classic playoff games, uh, Phillies and Astros in 1980. And, and I remember I had to work, so I missed that game. So it, it, it was surreal. And I think that, you know, we got, we got through it. I think we still have a long way to go. But I think, you know, it's, it's certainly getting better. But sports, losing sports the way we did like that was, was difficult. It, it just, it really was. I mean, we, like you said, that time of year, you know, we've looked for, I've looked forward to that since I was a kid. And, and then when you were a kid and liked sports, that was our time, you know, where how many hours did we sit there and watch tournament games together, you know? Um, and, and we'd yeah. be like, what, what channel should we go to? You know, what, what should we, especially <laughs> when it went to like Turner and, you know, and they had the different channels like they do now. Uh, that was, that was a lot of fun. You know? So, um, so anyway, hopefully we pray that we get better and hopefully we pray that it's, it's a regular baseball season and uh, nobody gets sick and slowly, you know, that uh, we can go to games again, you know, it, it'll be, it'll be good. It'll be good. So, yeah. All right. Uh, let's get some music on. Let's wrap up. Uh, been fun. And so we got a lot to look forward to this coming week today and, and uh, next week and probably a lot that we can talk about uh, next week. So Kenny, take us home. All right. Enjoy Selection Sunday. Um, in the meantime, this is Kenny Squared N. And Kenny. With Sports on the Positive Tip. We'll see you guys next week. All right. <laughs>